so hello everyone and welcome to this uh, next session so today we will be uh, discussing system of particles and center of mass uh, revision session 2 class 11 So in the previous lecture we were discussing about uh, the position of center of mass which we calculate by this formula center of mass being the symmetry point with respect to mass distribution or in terms of integration we can calculate it as integration of rtm where tm is a mass element divided by total mass then uh, the next thing we saw was that, that if part of the system is in motion then uh, the center of mass will also be in motion according to this set of formula displacement of center of mass being summation of m into displacement divided by summation of mass or total mass velocity of center of mass is summation mv by total mass and the acceleration of center of mass is summation ma divided by total mass now before we proceed further from the third equation that is this one here you will understand the concept of impulse momentum theorem or newton second law how it is applicable to a system of particles so summation of m into the velocity of center of mass becomes summation mv or we can say the total mass of the system into velocity of center of mass is summation of mv where we understand here that capital m is the total mass so now this is what we define the momentum of the system as the linear momentum of the system is defined as the total mass into velocity of center of mass and we can therefore see that the momentum of a system is equal to the summation of the linear momenta the vector sum of its individual particles because this quantity is summation mv which is nothing but the vector sum of the linear momenta of the individual particles so first and foremost this is how we define the linear momentum of a system of particles a discrete particle system it is defined as the total mass into the instantaneous velocity of the center of mass now next thing is if we differentiate this equation on both sides with respect to time or apply rate of change to both sides so rate of change of linear momentum becomes the instantaneous rate of change of summation p for all the particles so further this becomes summation into rate of change of linear momenta of individual particles so that becomes summation of fi where fi is the net force acting on a particular particle okay. now if we use the concept of newton second law that in this summation of net force on all particles what happens is this becomes the net external force this 
summation of net force on all particles on a system that becomes equal to the net external force due to newton's third law because the internal forces cancel in action reaction pairs Okay, so the net external force acting on the system, therefore, equals to rate of change of momentum of the system. Or we can say impulse due to net external force is change in momentum of the system. So this is our impulse momentum theorem. For a system of particles. So I'll just leave you with a moment to go through this section. This is extremely important.
okay let's uh, continue next so now the most important thing we understand from this impulse momentum theorem is that if the net external force on a system is zero then its momentum remains conserved okay. so that is the principle of linear momentum conservation so if f external is equal to zero that is the net external force on a system is zero then its linear momentum which is the total mass into velocity of center of mass is conserved So this process is called linear momentum conservation. Momentum of a system is conserved if f external is equal to zero. So these two statements mutually imply each other. If linear momentum is conserved, that that means net force must be zero, and vice versa. If the net force is zero, then linear momentum must be conserved. So let us look at some examples of the application of this concept next. So next, let's say we have a system like this. A system of two blocks joined by a spring on a frictionless surface. So given M1 is equal to 6 kilograms, M2 is equal to 3 kilograms, and the spring constant is, let us say, 8 newtons per centimeter. Now, the blocks are pushed. against the spring to a compression of let's say 10 centimeters and released from rest find their maximum speeds So what is happening here is that some external agent is initially pushing both the blocks with equal force against each other to keep the spring at a compression of 10 centimeters. So initially some external agent is applying equal and opposite force like this so that the spring is at a compression of this much now obviously the spring applies outward spring force it's yeah, not like this now from this position the system is released so the moment it is released what happens is that the blocks accelerate outwards because of the action of the spring. So 
so the spring is pushing so as a result of that they have accelerations but that acceleration is varying so initial acceleration just after release is you can see kx not divided by a1 and kx not divided by a2 now what happens is if you look at the system at some intermediate stage so we also understand the fact that it has variable acceleration for the individual blocks but more than that we understand that the system center of mass remains stationary so if it has come to a stage where this is now compressed only by x where is here initially it was compressed by l minus x not so a1 was this much but by now this has developed some linear velocity also along with acceleration so the first thing we can see is that if we define our system as the combination of two blocks plus the spring for this system net external force is zero so the linear momentum of the system is conserved and happens to be zero because the system started from rest so what happens is that the center of mass never moves so the linear momentum of the system is zero it means that acceleration of center of mass is zero so summation ma is zero so you can see above that or in this case you can see that the masses of the block was 6 and 3 see this is true okay and velocity of the center of mass at any instant is zero because linear momentum is zero so you can see that v1's magnitude is half of v okay. so you can also see that mechanical energy of the system is conserved that is change in kinetic energy plus change in elastic potential of energy of the spring is zero so conservation of energy becomes our second equation in solving these two equations the conservation of linear momentum and conservation of mechanical energy we will be able to come up with the final result so you can see the kinetic energy of the system is this kind of relation 
x naught square minus x square. So the kinetic energy will be maximum when x is zero. That means v one and v two, the individual speeds are maximum at the instant when the spring is back to natural length. This maximum kinetic energy of the system okay so now we can substitute all this over here so we can see that Okay, so for example, from this we can get V1's maximum value will come out to be square root of this much. And accordingly, V2's maximum value. Okay, and x naught was ten centimeters. V1's maximum value is so much, and accordingly, V2's maximum value, by following all these steps, come out to be 4 by 3 meters per second. Correction to that unit. So, these will be the maximum speeds of the two blocks, and they will be achieved at the instant when. The system comes back to the natural length position of the spring. So this was a typical example of the application of linear momentum conservation. It becomes something important at our level over here. And in this question, we saw additionally along with linear momentum conservation, we are also using conservation of uh, mechanical energy. Next, let's move on to another 
type of example of the same. So let us say a battle tank. Of total mass. M naught. At T equal to zero. Initially. At rest. On a smooth surface. Starts. Firing shots at the rate of N shells per second. Each shell of mass small m, m being very small compared to the initial mass of the battle tank at a speed p naught relative to the tank so we have to find acceleration of the tank due to the recoil force as a function of tank T. Okay, so I'll just give you a moment to go through this question and we'll discuss this.
Okay, so this type of question can be solved by different methods, including impulse momentum, variable mass system, etc. But we will solve it here by very simple understanding of conservation of linear momentum. Okay, so initially at t equal to zero. This was a mass m naught. This was at zero speed, and it starts ejecting a particle at v naught relative to itself. So at some time t, in comparison, this one's mass has become m. Where m is equal to m naught minus delta m, delta m being the total mass it has removed. In time t, so that is number of bullets per unit time multiplied by mass of each bullet multiplied by the time. Total mass of shells fired in time t. So it's number of shells per second into mass of each shell multiplied by the time t. So now this will be. Fired at a speed v prime, which is going to be v naught minus v, because its relative speed is v v naught with respect to this moving time. So now, if we see at a very small time or a differential time later, this one's mass has become m minus d m. And during that time, it comes like this. Okay. So. in time dt the mass of shells fired becomes nm into dt and the velocity with which the shells fired with respect to ground frame becomes becomes v not minus v because this mass is fired at relative speed v not with respect to the time okay so if you look at this system now how it's evolving between time t and t plus dt momentum is conserved okay. so conservation of linear momentum the system will show us that minus mv i cap should be equal to minus of m minus t m into v plus t v i cap plus t m into v prime I can, or we can write this removing the unit vector okay. 
where we understand that in this equation the rate of firing shells into the mass of each shell into dt and it's very small compared to capital M. So this equation becomes like this. Now in this equation, the term Tm into Tv will tend to 0 because it's the product of two differential terms. Dm is a very small mass and Dv is a very small change in velocity during that instant. So we have Mdv minus Dm into V0 becomes 0. So Mdv is equal to Tm V0 which means that m into dv by dt is equal to dm by dt into v0. So remember dm was the rate at which bullets were being fired multiplied by mass of each shell into time dt. So mass into instantaneous acceleration becomes this rate of firing shells into mass of each shell into m0. So the instantaneous acceleration becomes like this where m is the instantaneous mass. So m is equal to m0 minus nmt as a function of time. So the acceleration of the tank as a function of time becomes the rate of firing shells into mass of each shell divided by the mass at that instant which is going to be this much into the speed of fire the relative speed of fire so this becomes our final answer acceleration as a function of time here n is number of shells fired per second v naught is the relative speed at which shells are fired. Mass of each shell. So the initial total mass. So in terms of these quantities and the variable of time, we have got the instantaneous acceleration. Okay. So this is another example of the application of linear momentum conservation. Now let's move on to another type of question. So again on a smooth horizontal surface let's say we have this kind of an object we 
which has a curving but smooth surface like this. So this wedge has mass capital M. Now what we are doing is a small particle of mass small m is released from this position which is at a height of h. You want to find the speed of the wedge. At the instant when the particle slides off the end A. Assume the particle is gently placed at the end P and released from rest. So I'll just leave you with a moment to go through this question, then we'll discuss this.
okay so let's look at the solution of this question quickly so once again what we'll understand is that as the particle is sliding down this object the interactive forces between them are such that the object starts to get the wedge starts to get pushed towards the left uh, rather towards the right as the particle is sliding down towards the left so starting from here this is also at rest this is also at rest the wedge and particle as a system are at rest so the initial velocity of the center of mass is zero for the wedge plus the particle okay. now as the particle because of gravitational force acting on it some kind of a contact force so this is the force picture so by the time the particle has come down the slope of the wedge to a certain extent the wedge has moved towards the right to a certain extent so by the time something like this has happened you can see that the wedge has made a displacement like this but the particle has made a horizontal displacement which is in this sort of direction so anyway now if you look at the interactive forces between the particle and the wedge they are like this whereas if you look at the external forces on the system so you can see that for the system that consists of the particle plus the wedge external forces capital mg small mg and normal reaction from the ground are vertical and the normal reaction between them is n so that has an action reaction phase so it cancels out so because the external forces are all vertical that means horizontal component of the net external force is zero so if we take the horizontal direction as our x axis the system's horizontal momentum can be conserved not conserve momentum for the system but we can conserve the horizontal momentum for the system so this was our initial state and finally when the particle is about to slide off the wedge so at that instant let's say the situation is like this the particle has a speed v1 and the wedge has a speed v2 so i take this as a final instant this was our initial state now this is our final state so in this also what should happen the velocity of the center of mass should become zero because both are moving horizontally okay. so this is happening because horizontal momentum is conserved and equal to zero for the system so 
that gives us an equation that capital M V two minus small m V one is zero, or V one is equal to m by small m V two. Sorry, it's the other way around. So V one is nine because V one V two's ratio M one M two's ratio is one by one. Now the other thing is also mechanical energy will be conserved because there's no non-conservative force here. So this particle is coming down to a height of h. It's coming down from here to a height of h. By conservation of mechanical energy, change in kinetic energy plus change in gravitational potential energy should be zero. So kinetic energy from initial to final state has gone from zero to. Half m v1 square plus half capital M v2 square, and the gravitational potential energy has decreased by mgh. They should be zero. So this is our second equation. So we'll just substitute the things over here. So this will be v2 by 9 whole square. Capital M we can substitute as 9 times small m. To mg. So this being our second equation, we substitute this information here. We get this, and of course this also. So oh, my mistake. So not v2 by 9. This is v2 into 9. So we get 90 by 2. V2 square is equal to G. So we can get answer. Okay. Now H was 20 meters. So this is the speed of the block or of the wedge. Where the speed of the particle will be nine times this at that instant. Okay, so this is another important type of application of conservation of linear momentum, along with the spring-based problem that we've seen earlier. So with this, we'll conclude today's session here, people. Now, next time we will look at more applications of conservation of linear momentum, including the situations of collisions, uh, where whatever type of collision we have, whether it is one-dimensional, head-on, elastic, inelastic, or oblique, 
elastic, inelastic, or collisions of multiple particles with each other instead of just two bodies colliding. Linear momentum conservation will be a common concept that we use across all collisions, along with other concepts like whether the collision is elastic or not. So accordingly, the coefficient of resistivation set. So we will start looking into those type of uh, questions in the next lecture. And also, we will look at a bit of variable mass system using rocket propulsion system, etc. So accordingly, prepare for the next lecture because uh, otherwise it might be little difficult to follow the questions uh, straight up. So that's it for today's session, people, and wish you all the best. Thanks for attending.